Hello, my name is Sula, host of Sula's Big Adventures. I've decided to start an ambitious project on becoming an amateur astronomer in a multiple part series. And this is chapter one, how I became an amateur astronomer. I grew up in a small rural town in the southeastern part of the United States. The population of the whole county at that time was probably under 40,000 people. And we grew up in a house on a third of an acre, but it was surrounded by agricultural fields at that time, so we had plenty of access to open spaces and dark skies. When we were kids, we were always outside, running around, building forts, and collecting ants for ant farms, and of course, playing football, being in the South. And in the evening, we also enjoyed going outside and playing games and also lying on the grass and staring into the dark, starry sky. I remember vividly seeing the Milky Way splashed across the sky on summer evenings. I didn't know what anything else was. In those days, we didn't have internet. Nobody had a computer. There were no smartphones. We didn't have any reference books. I didn't know what anything was, and I didn't have any way to look it up. Mama did buy a complete set of the Encyclopedia Britannica because she felt sorry for the traveling salesman, but those were enormous books. I did consult them for my book reports in school, but they weren't practical to take outside into the grass to find out what we were looking at, so we would just make things up about the star patterns. But to this day, I still enjoy staring into a dark, starry sky. Some of my most profound and enduring memories involve astronomical events. When NASA began the Apollo missions, I was enthralled. I'm going to have to give away my age here to discuss this, but if you've watched any of my previous videos, I'm sure you've noticed that I long ago lost that youthful glow. However, I have not lost my youthful exuberance. Anyway, Every Apollo launch I watched with rapture on our little tube TV. And when NASA launched Apollo 11, I was captivated. I was glued to the TV as Walter Cronkite told all about what was happening. And I remember vividly June the 24th, 1969, when Apollo 11 launched. I may cry thinking about it. I kept a journal of all of the Apollo missions that I recall from that time. And here it is now. Apollo 11 through 16, book about space flights. The flight of Apollo 11. The astronauts are Neil Armstrong, Edward Aldrin, Mike Collins. It will take three days to make it to the moon, so they will land on the 21st. The rocket has landed on the moon, but we still wait for Neil to come out. He's putting on his suit and stuff. Now he walks out. He walks slowly because of gravity, and he walks on the moon. Neil's first words when he took one step was, One small step for a man and a giant leap for mankind. And then I go on to Apollo 12, 13, 14. I saved the newspaper clipping from the next day. And that is something I will never soon forget. Another memory is a sad one, and that is that in 1970, there was a total solar eclipse that passed right over our house in South Carolina. Of course, we had no way to look at it, and the teacher told us not to look at it, and instead she told us to make a pinhole in a piece of paper and look at the projection of the sun on the driveway as it passed over. And incredibly, that's all I saw of a total solar eclipse on a clear day in 1970. But I didn't choose astronomy as my career path. I chose something I was good at and 
allowed me to help people and have a good career and a good life. And so after I moved to the Bay Area, I started my career and I didn't really have time to devote to astronomy and frankly, I was quite poor at that time anyway. Instead, during this time, I read all the astronomy books I could get my hands on, including Carl Sagan's Cosmos in the 80s, late 80s, Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time, which took me a very long time to read. I had to keep rereading each sentence several times before I could understand what he was saying. The Whole Shebang by Timothy Ferris and Six Easy Pieces by Richard Fenman. He died in 1988, so this must have been published posthumously. It's the essential physics explained by its most brilliant teacher. And I read some other books, and I also watched Jack Horkheimer, Star Hustler. If you're young, I'm sure you don't remember him. He's dead now, too. He produced five-minute programs, and it was the most popular of its time. And each one was about something about the night sky. And you can see how old they are because these are all VHS tapes. <laughs> well, I really like those. And they told you a little bit about the sky in each episode. And he would start each one with a little ethereal version of Debussy's Arabesque, which I really like. Jack Horkheimer would end each episode by saying, Keep looking up! Finally, in 1995, I had saved up enough money to buy my first telescope. I walked into the store, Orion Telescopes and Binoculars on Chestnut Street in San Francisco, and bought the cheapest telescope they had, a little four-inch reflector on a wooden tripod and an Altaz base. And it must have been really cheap because I barely remember it. In fact, I asked a friend recently if she had a telescope I could borrow, and she said, well, the only one I have is that one you gave me. <laughs> and it turned out she still has that little reflector. My brother told me about these telescopes that you could get that were very cheap and had enormous aperture. And so I went back to the Orion Telescopes and Binoculars store soon thereafter, and I walked in and I bought a classic Orion 6-inch Dobsonian. I loved that Dobsonian. I tried to use it in my backyard in San Francisco, but in addition to light pollution, I could barely see any part of the sky. And so I would put that Dobsonian into my Durango and I would drive out to Yosemite National Park in the Eastern Sierra and I would just stargaze for hours and hours. I just loved it. But eventually my career took over and I was finding that I wasn't using it as much as I would have liked and I gave that to my brother. I did buy a third telescope a four inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain, and it was just on a little Altaz base and a tripod. And I would put that telescope into my backpack and I would take it on trips. So one Thanksgiving, I put the little Mead Schmidt Cassegrain in my backpack and I went to Canyonlands National Park for Thanksgiving weekend. And after setting up the tent on Thanksgiving day, I sat down on the ground and I was looking into the sky and all of a sudden a giant fiery ball, a fireball, descended and just raced across the sky to the ground. I'll never forget it. I ran and got a piece of paper and I quickly made a sketch of it and I still have that piece of paper. And the next year I went back to Canyonlands National Park, which used to be a Bortle one. I don't know if it is now because of the exponential growth of nearby Moab, but at that time it was very dark. And I went back the next year, Thanksgiving day, finished setting up the tent, again, sitting on the ground, looking into the sky, and another fireball in the same area of the sky descended straight down from the sky and a giant, enormous fireball 
two fireballs the exact same day, one year apart. Something I will never forget as long as I live. Another astronomical event that I will never forget is that every year my parents used to come visit me in the Bay Area and my daddy always liked to go to either Yosemite or Sequoia National Park. So that particular year we decided to go to Yosemite and which is a portal one and we went out after dark and looked up in the sky and I'll never forget it. Hail Bob was like a dream and the sky was so bright and so big and you could see two tails just streaming across the sky. It was incredible and I will never forget that. A friend of mine went to visit her mother in Arizona at that time and she happened to live next door to Bop and she brought back a signed photograph of the Hell Bop Comet signed by Bop. I think that was in 1997 was the last time Hell Bop was visible. In 1998 Sally Ride, the first American woman astronaut in space, came to talk at Cal State University Hayward. And my friend Lori and I went with her daughter. And after Sally talked, they told us that we could all meet Sally Ride and ask her a question. So we got in line and I, I just shook her hand and I asked her to sign her picture. And she did. And here it is. But my friend Lori's daughter, when it was her turn, asked Sally Ride, what do you do when you have your period and you're in space? I was mortified. I don't remember what Sally Ride said. I'm pretty sure she said something with the plum and diplomacy. <laughs> but I, I will never forget that either. As I approached the end of my career, I decided to buy a place in Montana that had lots of open space and dark skies. And after buying that, after a while, I decided I should get a telescope again. Since I had given all of mine away, I gave my four inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain to my niece's husband and he says the wind blew it over even though nothing ever happened to it when I put it in my backpack and took it to the desert. But anyway, he said he broke it. But after I got my place in Montana, I started to look for a telescope, but it was the middle of the pandemic and I couldn't find anything. Everything was on back order. So I ended up getting this enormous six inch Skywatcher Evo Star 150 millimeter ED refractor. It weighs 25 pounds and I needed something big to put it on. So I got this hefty, Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mount, and that whole setup weighs about 125 pounds, but I go out every clear night I can when I'm there, and I take it out, and I have thoroughly enjoyed using that giant refractor and a Bortle 3 sight. It's been wonderful. I've added a few more things to my collection, including a little 80 millimeter Orion ED80 refractor for here in the Bay Area and I go out as much as I can here as well and I've learned a lot over the years even though I've been in, interested in astronomy for years and years I still learn something new every day. I'm not an astronomer by trade and I'm certainly no expert but I think I know a lot and I would like to share it with other people on your journey to becoming an amateur astronomer. It's a wonderful hobby full of surprises and you don't need any special equipment to get started. You can start by looking up into the sky with your naked eye and just trying to learn the constellations and the stars. Hopefully that interests you and you decide to get something a little more if nothing more than a pair of binoculars. You can see a lot with binoculars. And then you can move up to a telescope, and I know a lot about that, and I could help with that too. And then hopefully you won't end up like a lot of people do with a piece of equipment in a closet collecting dust and continue on in this journey of becoming an amateur astronomer. area. And I agree with Terence Dickinson who says if you're a beginner, 
and you're interested in becoming an amateur astronomer, set that aside until later. Start with the basics, looking up into the sky with your naked eye and learning the constellations and learning a little bit about basic astronomy and how the sky works. And, and then later on, try astrophotography. And that's a good segue into my next chapter because when I started telling my family about all these things I could see with my telescope and how wonderful they were and mind-blowing, they would always say, well, show us a picture. And I would say, well, I can't. I don't have an astrophotography camera. And my brother, when I did start sending pictures, would always say, is that what you can see with your eye? Well, no, it's not what you can see with your eye by any means. And so the next chapter will be having reasonable expectations. What can you really see through a telescope? So I hope you enjoyed this opening chapter of my series, How I Became an Amateur Astronomer, and I'll see you in the next episode.